which has been in existence for uh, 26 years, has offered over 30 different languages, and currently we offer uh, 12 languages, which I just happen to have a list of. But uh, before I read that list, I'd just like to tell you that all of these languages are being offered because a student or students have come into our office and they've asked us if we could offer the language, which we usually do if we have three students or more because uh, we offer, uh, we have a fee that uh, would cover this. We started out being uh, uh, instructionally self-supporting. We are now moving on to being self-supporting. And uh, <laughs> it's the times. Uh, but in any event, uh, one of the things that we have done over the years is to produce uh, CDs and DVDs. Uh, the CDs are uh, already part of history. The DVDs, at least if you're interested, you can look at uh, some of the uh, titles over on the table after the presentations are over. But in any event, uh, just so that you know, this semester, uh, we're offering Swahili, Cantonese, Korean, Hindi, Kurdish, Vietnamese, Thai, Tagalog, Swedish, Ukrainian, Norwegian, and Scots Gaelic. And you will be hearing from at least three of the individuals who uh, offer and teach those languages. Uh, I was going to say this evening. I'm not sure. This afternoon, this evening, whatever works. Uh, and uh, first of all, we'd, we'd like uh, some of our uh, tutors, instructors, to greet you, we couldn't get them all here at the same time in the same place. However, uh, Ryan Fagan, who is our media specialist, uh, has put them together. Uh, what several hours of work took, you will see in about 15 seconds. But uh, we would like to offer you greetings from our uh, instructional staff. Hey, Warangora. Hamjambo Wate. Karibuni. Hey. Good afternoon, trevli to treffas. Kamara ha shuvulu anju. Annyeonghaseyo, bangapsumnida. Namaste. Apka kya hal hai? Dobry den. Yak spravi. Magandang hapon. Chao kabang. Lei ho. Bui si khila. Well, there you are. <laughs> Uh, we're, by the way, one of the uh, few uh, institutions in the country to offer Chechen, perhaps the only one, but uh, those statistics are sometimes hard to come by. Uh, in any event, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Jun Ru, who is a native of Korea, PhD student uh, at the SLAT program, Second Language Acquisition and Teaching, and uh, who has been uh, an instructor in uh, critical languages for the past five years and uh, has taught all four levels of four years of Korean. And I'd uh, uh, like you to welcome Jun Ryu. I'm a student, so I have paper. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Jun Yu, Ryu Ji Eun, and I'm from Korea. And Korea is located in Asia between Japan and China. So, what would you shout it out if you're in this case? What would you say? Help, help me, right? Yes, Korean would do the same thing, but only one difference. We use a word for a human being rather than just me. The literal translation would mean the save a human being. It doesn't matter who I am or who me is, whether I'm rich or, or whether I'm native Korean or a foreigner. You should save me because I'm just a human being. So respecting a human being just because of being a human itself is reflected well and the philosophy of Korean alphabet Hangul. Hangul is not derived from Chinese character nor any other languages. In 1446, Hangul was created by King Sejong during the Joseon Dynasty. And Hangul was proclaimed under the original name Hunmin Jeongim, which literally meant the correct sounds for the instructions of the people. 
and you see the picture on the left side, that's the preface of Hume Jangam, the original preface. And in the preface of this proclamation, King Sejong states, being of foreign origin, Chinese characters are incapable of capturing uniquely Korean meanings. Therefore, many common people have no way to express their thoughts and feelings. Out of my sympathy for their difficulties, I have created a set of 28 letters. The letters are very easy to learn, and it is my fervent hope that they improve the quality of life of all people. The statement captures the essence of King Sejong's determination and dedication to culture, independence, and commitment to the welfare of the people. So both scientific and artistic consideration went into the making of Hangul. For example, consonant shape represent the shape of articulators. But perhaps most influenced aspect was the Oriental philosophies, including concepts like chunjiin or heaven, earth, and human, and yin and yang. It was a widely held Confucian belief during the King Sejong's time that the word consisted of three main elements, which is heaven, earth, and human. And human served as a mediator between the two. And this notion is called chunjin. As you can see from the slide, the heaven is represented as a dot, and the earth as a horizontal line, and human as a vertical line. And they are the basis of vowels of Hangul. So to put it simply, yin and yang is about a constant interaction of natural opposites. Things like dark and light, dark and bright, a male and females, hot and cold. Nothing stands on its own, and there must be a harmony among all of these things. This theory was taken very seriously in the creation of Hangul, and as a result, every vowel must be accompanied with a consonant to make a syllable block in Korean. No one letter can stand alone, so it's all mixed together and built up to make a syllable block in Hangul. Also, the bright vowels, like A ah or O, oh, go together to describe light or something lively, and dark vowels go together to describe something heavy and deep. So that represented very well in the descriptive words. On the hmm, picture on the right, it's a dripping, really light. It's described, described as pong dang pong dang. And if something heavy like rock is dropped, it's called pung dong pung dong. So do you hear the difference? If it's light, pong dang pong dang. And if it's heavy, pung dong pung dong. So even from the sound of it, you can actually tell or actually picture it. And lastly, I will wrap up my personal presentation by reading a poem. I will let you just enjoy the sound of Korean. 진달래꽃 김소월 나보기가 역겨워 가실 때에는 말없이 고이 보내 드리오리다. 영변의 약산 진달래꽃 아름다다 가실 길에 뿌리오리다. 가시는 걸음걸음 놓인 그 꽃을 사뿐히 지려밟고 가시옵소서. 나보기가 역겨워 가실 때에는 죽어도 아니 눈물 흘리오리다. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, I would also just mention that uh, uh, we've asked our uh, instructors to talk a little bit about the language because uh, language is not just language, language is culture. The moment one opens one's mouth, the culture is there. And uh, of course, different uh, cultures, languages 
are expressed differently and see the world differently. And that's what's so fascinating to those of us who study language. In any event, uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Telus Machibia, or Telus Fori Machibia, who is uh, an instructor in Swahili at Critical Languages. Uh, he's a native of Tanzania, and he is an adjunct lecturer uh, at Africana Studies, at the Africana Studies program, my colleague uh, Alain Philippe Durand uh, is in charge of. And uh, he's been there since 2004, almost 10 years. Uh, and uh, his areas of interest are indigenous cultures, uh, right-based approaches to rural development, and empowerment of sustainability. And I might add, this summer, uh, <coughs> TELUS will be uh, in Africa working uh, in developing uh, just those uh, areas that I mentioned. And uh, TELUS also has received his PhD from the University of Arizona in Renewable Resources. So uh, TELUS, please. Jambo, this was one of the greetings. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you here and uh, to celebrate uh, uh, Humanities Week. I just wanted to kind of make fun of our languages. <laughs> and, uh, but more important, I think, also while I'm doing that, I want to kind of talk about the importance of a language as a propagation of a culture. Uh, so we are celebrating the cultures of uh, all over the world from critical languages. Uh, but there is a serious thing in what I'm going to make a fun of, how a language really tells us about a culture. And I'm going to kind of use the Bantu people of Africa and uh, how their language has really propagated over very many years their culture. Uh, to start with, uh, very quickly, uh, the Bantu languages can be divided in a few major sections. Uh, but the one that I'm more interested in is really uh, this area here, the Bantu speaking people. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for. Is that better? Better for everyone? OK. Uh, the Bantu speaking, let me try to adjust to. Uh, the Bantu speaking people are the ones that I'm going to uh, concentrate on as an example because uh, the Swahili language that is taught at the Critical Languages program, uh, the Swahili language that is taught at the Critical Languages program uh, is one of those uh, Bantu groups of languages. Uh, even though we are saying Swahili uh, is one big group, it is really made up of a lot of Bantu groups, and uh, it is a civilization that started around oh, maybe the, 18, the 800s or 1000 AD, if you uh, talk about a civilization uh, that was really along the uh, East African coast, around the Indian Ocean. For the Bantu to talk about cultures and also languages and how they interact in terms of propagating or actually just uh, not just the propagation, but also the transmission of the culture within uh, the community itself. I want to pick one thing about the Bantu and the, their nouns. In other words, uh, and I really mean it, the Bantu people are really obsessed with nouns. That is their creation story in the sense that the creation of the nouns is the foundation of everything that goes on with the Bantu people. And because of that obsession, every noun that was created actually had to be given a body. And I'm sure you can say, uh, well, not all nouns really have bodies. I think we can all agree. In other words, uh, a thing is the noun for Swahili, kitu, a thing. Includes us, includes the nouns that you actually can't see or can't even touch. And so for those ones, then the language to propagate that creation story of having to have a body actually gives it a body. So think of something like, oh, I don't know, think of a noun you can't really see. Uh, happiness is a noun you really can't see. So you have to force it to have a body. And I want to just give you very few examples of how that is done. Uh, 
Here is an example, feelings. Uh, we all know feelings really like uh, anger. You can see an expression of anger, but that's not what we are saying. We are saying the actual feeling, the actual anger itself. You can't really see it. And so the way it is done, therefore, you say, I see anger. I see hunger. I see happiness. And so notice by saying that I see what has happened. You just gave it a body. Because if you can see it, then it is there. Or another way, because you are just doing that for sounds, for example, uh, you actually hit the noun. For example, suppose you want to talk about noise. Noise, you really can't see the noise. So you hit noise. What happens when you hit noise? You are hitting a thing. Therefore, noise all of a sudden has a body. Uh, and many, many other ones. So for example, let me just take a very quick example. I'm feeling hungry. You can't find that in the Swahili language. Because a feeling uh, of hunger is the proper way. And so the way you actually say, I see hunger. Or interchangeably, I hear hunger. And so by saying that way, notice therefore you have this compound verb, if you will, which has the actual mechanism of making that noun make an activity. Uh, another very good example, if however you are hungry, notice the feeling is something, for example, in our languages, therefore a feeling hasn't reached. So that hunger is on its way, it's coming, and it hasn't actually reached you. So when you say, I am hungry, basically, therefore, you begin to talk about associations you are associating yourself with that noun hunger. And so the word I'm hungry doesn't exist in Swahili. Instead, you have hunger. So you say, I am with hunger. So you notice here, therefore, by associating yourself with this hunger, you actually gave it a body uh, and many, many other ways you can do that. So you can think of very many things that are actually feelings. And the way you talk about them is actually giving them a body one way or the other. Now, talking about associations, I was told uh, our critical languages program coordinator speaks Swahili very well, Emmy, uh, And she says, you must make sure you also talk about a different creation story of how all these bodies that have body are also organized in a way that you can identify them. We just heard from our Korean uh, colleague here. For example, all living things that have motion belong to one group. And then all living things that don't have motion, trees, for example, we think they are living, but they don't have a motion. Uh, all living things with motion are like humans, the cockroaches and the whale, anything that moves, we are all in one group. And so the creation stories of these bodies, which all have bodies, obviously, but also they actually are classified in a certain way that they are equal. And so, for example, the trees are also the same group that my hand, the subset of the living that I have body belong to. So my hand is kind of talked about the same way you actually talk about a tree. And then another subset of the uh, living without life subsets, for example, a flower is another group. And so you can keep going on that. And the, the Bantu thing that I was told I must also mention is associations, therefore, depend on what you're associating with. So if you're associating with things of the same group, then you're equals. If you're associating yourself with things that are lower in your group, then you are a caretaker. And so notice here, therefore, if this gentleman here has friends, is with a friend, has, a ch has children, or has money. All of those things, are, or he is with friends in this particular case. In all of those cases, he's just associated with them. And so notice here by the association idea, all of a sudden, uh, this person doesn't actually own anything. In other words, therefore, in the language, you don't have ownership. Well, uh, I hope briefly uh, we see that languages actually can help us to actually understand the culture and also 
within that culture or within that group, you see that languages actually propagate uh, these cultures. My ancestors have looked at creation stories this very same way, and so we are very happy to share those ideas uh, with you in terms of uh, cultural differences. Well, I am not <laughs> I'm not associated with it more time. <laughs> so if you're associated with questions, I will have, have a lot of happiness answering them. I'm associated with thanking TELUS for his presentation. <laughs> and uh, I'm also associated with <laughs> introducing uh, Muriel Fisher, who is our last presenter. And uh, I believe you have a handout along with your program. Uh, Muriel is uh, one of the last to use paper. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to welcome Muriel Fisher, who has, uh, uh, has a long list of credits that I'd just like to briefly acquaint you with. Uh, she's a native speaker from the Isle of Skye. Uh, she founded the Tucson Gaelic Institute in 1983. Uh, and uh, every summer, Muriel retreats to the Isle of Skye and uh, uh, conducts uh, sh summer short courses there. And uh, she also currently here at the university is working with the linguistics department uh, on a National Science Foundation grant. And in between everything else and tutoring at, at critical languages, uh, Muriel was off to Seattle uh, for a presentation that uh, perhaps she can tell you a little bit more about uh, when Muriel joins us. Anyway, Muriel Fisher. Well, good. Good. Well, when we talk about Pekan Kalik, Ruiv, how do we make clear things? Just now, we're talking about the Yakush and the Hoa. So, when Kalik and Ruiv, no, I hook in. I feel me make count of Ruiv. Now, we're talking about Alapanach, so be a dollar, just be a soonish, an attendant, personal, echgehein. Um, so, which is all to say that no self-respecting Sky Woman would be seen dead without one of these. <laughs> this is Dale, and Dale has very kindly agreed to come along and uh, show you how a Scotsman out for the evening would be turned out. And jolly fabulous it is. <laughs> Now, I could have had him play the pipes, but I think you all know what pipe music sounds like, and I think we're all right without it, really, in <laughs> all things considered. And he's probably quite relieved that I didn't uh, uh, make him play the pipes. Now, I... Oh, wait. Now, maybe we can just stop at this uh, slide right here. As Ryan uh, is trying to do that, oh, that's fine. So you can stop there, too. Or you could perhaps stop there. <laughs> or just never mind for the moment. It's not doing it, is it? Oh, well, we're fine. Um, oh, it stopped here. OK. Um, rather, did it? Yes, it did. Has it stopped, Ryan? OK, then I'm going to take advantage and use this momentary pause in the slides to jump straight to what this is. Um, in the background, you can see um, a mountain which dominated the glen that I grew up in called Helleval. And Helleval is a Norse name. Uh, we have quite a lot of words in Gaelic that come from Norse. And one of the ways that you spot them right away is that they begin with the letter H. And although we can make Gaelic spellings of them, we don't generally uh, bother. And if they do, I just say, no, don't. Just leave it in the Norse. It's fine. And uh, so this little indentation that you see here is where my father and mother and the villagers would come. Do you see a sort of little wee indentation? It was called the pit. 
And this is where we would gather uh, in order to go and cut the peats. Now, I'm just sort of cutting and jumping ahead of all the languagey things that I was going to tell you, because when I was talking to Tellus earlier in the week, he was trying to understand how our people could possibly dig mud up out of the ground, dry it, and then burn it for fuel. So I brought my peat along with me, which Dale is very kindly unwrapping for us. And afterwards, when I'm finished, we, well, I'll put it here, but afterwards you may all touch it if you wish. Um, it's not often that you get to see Morantang Dale. I'm going to share that. Oh, good. Um, so this is where my this is one of this is my father handed me this, and it's one of the last things that or the last thing that he gave me before he died, and so I have it, and I have resisted the temptation to burn it. It's really baby coal, is what it is, and this uh, little wee indentation is where my auntie and I would put out a, what in today's terms would be considered a gourmet picnic. Because um, while they, there would be about maybe 12 people, couples usually, because if I'm cutting the peat, you're coming, and you're coming, and you're coming, and you're coming, and of course so is Dale, but not dressed like that. And we all help each other cut the peats, and it's a two-person job. There's the cutting person and there's the throwing person, because they look sort of like adobe bricks. This one is broken. It's usually about this long. And my auntie and I would be the people who would make the food, and a, what I now realize is a linen tablecloth would be put on top of a tarpaulin in this pit. And of course we had cups because there was no plastic when I was wee. It was last century. And um, we had silver knives, you know, silver knives and forks because that's what we had. So we had china, um, silver. We had homemade scones, homemade oat cakes, you know, hard boiled eggs, homemade jam, um, gru, which is some kind of cheese in the English that is new cheese. I don't know. You, you, my mother made it and then you cut it and I didn't like it. <laughs> and then we would also have uh, perhaps some meat and there would be a salmon that my father would have poached from the bottom of our croft in the river because you know all the salmon belongs to the queen. And if the river that bears the salmon happens to run at the bottom of your croft, you are not permitted to take it. However, um, naturally, uh, you do, <laughs> with great subterfuge. But that's another whole story. You can keep, you can click now. And so it was just in the event that you could have seen the river that, oh yes, there's the river. That white house there is where I grew up. Do you see the one in front of the black trees? And now we're back to the pit. But <laughs> the river, <laughs> oh, so that's the river from which the salmon would be poached. And you can see it's not a highly populated area. The sea is right, there it is looking the other way, and that's the sea behind us. That's where I grew up, right there. It's called Ferenach Guere. I guess um, my father was from the Isle of Harris and my mother was from the Isle of Skye. And I just feel that all these slides are pretty, that's where I played all the time. So you can see how close it was. And that's Millevig. And oh, do you see the little wee rusty red roof? That is a color that is found throughout the highlands because, um, well, you've seen the color, that's all. The, uh, the houses used to have thatched roofs, and what happened was that in the 50s, they changed the thatched roofs to corrugated iron. And the corrugated iron was then replaced by slate. But the sheds, and that was my father's boathouse that had that rusty red, oh look, that's the old houses. So the, that 
that sort of beautiful red color, you see dots of it throughout the Scottish Highlands. It's just old corrugated tin roofs, but it's become part of the landscape now. Uh, Dale, do you think you could bring me the water, please? It's by my bag. handy. More than time. Oh, so this, that was a Pictish broch. You know, there are structures around the islands um, which were built in the Iron Age by the Picts. And um, this is the inside. They're usually two-walled structures. And this is, these are the steps inside the broch at Struan. And I think the rest of the pictures will speak for themselves. And I'll just tell you a wee tiny bit about Gaelic now. Um... Oh, I just realized there's, I can see the, the slides right there. There's Helaval. That was Helaval. I just realized that if I do yeah. this, I can see what's on the slides. How fabulous. Okay, so this is the view out my bedroom window. And Helaval Vor, I guess Helaval Vic. So big Helaval and we Helaval. And that's the glen. That's the, the, that's the view out the bedroom window. So anyway, Scottish Gaelic as a language, as you have probably gathered, doesn't sound anything like English. People often think that it would because, you know, it's from Scotland and people speak English there, but it really doesn't. The language sort of takes place, oh, the language takes place in the back of your throat. Now, this sign is a puzzle. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it's back. So um, you're driving along. You're actually on the mainland, and you're going to a very picturesque village called Plockton, uh, which comes from a Norse word, amplok, which means a lump. <laughs> <laughs> There's a broad Scots word for pimples that you get, and they're called plukes. It's from Plockton. Anyway, you're driving along to this most picturesque place, and then you suddenly see this sign, like in the middle of the gorse. That's gorse that's not in bloom. And you go, what? So the, the, an enterprising uh, man who hires boats out in Plockton, you can't get more, th more than a few miles from the sea anywhere where I grew up. So he has put this sign up. If you go on his boat trip, he will, in fact, give you a free boat trip if they don't see any seals. And so you, this eventually becomes clear. But when you're innocently driving along, you go, free if no seals? <laughs> Now, I haven't gone out in his boat yet, but there's always next year. So Gaelic itself, um, just to say, you know, what Tellus was saying about the language being a reflection of the people. Um, for example, well, we have only 60, 17 letters in the Gaelic alphabet. The letter H not being a letter in its own right, it's just simply a, um, a breathing is the best way I've heard it described. It messes up the sound of all the other letters, and so it's a nuisance in every poor Gaelic student's life. Um, we have no verb to have. So you can't actually ever say, I have uh, this piece of paper, or I have the peat. We have to say it in different ways. We have to say things like, um, a peat is at me. Is a red sweater at you? Um, is a wonderful outfit with him? So we use um, prepositions to have to denote possession. So we have um, things are at you, things are on you, and things are with you. And some things, um, like for example, we don't have the verb to love. It's not a verb in Gaelic. It is something that is at me on you, or at you on him, or at us on it. And, uh, <laughs> and there's a small category of feelings that come under the, in that 
are at me on you. Um, loving, hating, forgetting, needing, and being fond of. So it's essentially, I love you, I hate you, I forget you, um, I need you, I'm quite fond of you. <laughs> and, um, well, there's so much more that I could really just tell you about. Um, I think you all want to go to Scotland because it's so beautiful and it's kind of easy to go to. It's not that far away. It's only 6,000 miles away. And so... Um, I think I'd just like to say thank you to Dr. Dunkel for having allowed me to teach a critical languages forever. And uh, also I just wanted to say that you will, d you will be able to see Dale in his, and his cohorts at the um, Scottish, Scottish Highland Games which take place in Rito Park on the 2nd and 3rd of November. That's my little plug for this <laughs> lovely outfit. I guess I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to I'd like to thank Muriel and Dale for the presentation. And uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, Muriel speaking about the uh, uh, roofs over in, in Scotland reminded me of, of a time when I was working for the State Department and was driving a uh, foreign visitor, a visitor from abroad, uh, through uh, the deprived area of Beverly Hills. and. Uh, <laughs> At least that seems to be the impression, because as is driving through Beverly Hills, and you probably you've been there or you've seen pictures of it, and a uh, visitor turned to me and said, "You're taking me through a depressed area." I <laughs> said, "I don't think so." <laughs> We're trying to do it with a straight face, and I said, "Well, why do you say that?" Looked up and he said, "But, but those roofs—they're not made out of corrugated iron." <laughs> And that's my memory of Beverly Hills. At any rate, uh, I want to thank uh, Muriel and Dale and Tellus and uh, June Ryu. And I also want to thank uh, Amy Pressler, who was the program coordinator and who did all of the backstage work. And also Ryan Fagan, who is the media specialist. I also want to thank two people who aren't here. One is uh, Benazir Dadaeva, who you saw greeting you in Chechen and uh, also uh, Scott Brill, who will be retiring from the Critical Languages Program, but has been with us for many, many years and uh, is responsible for those DVDs that are out on display there. And rather than my say goodbye, I think Ryan can make uh, some of our tutors say goodbye and wish you well. Uh, and by the way, after that's over, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'd be glad to answer them, and we have up until just before 6 o'clock. Anyway, thank you very much. Adi Kayoila. Ciao, Tambi. Paalam po. Hey, Doa. Tak so much. How are you? Namaste. Thank you. Kwa herini, tutaonana siku ingine. Dopo bacinya. Haribo. Suga hashasumida, anyoi gaseyo. Daiga homa. Thank you.